All right, let's see. So Aiden, did so for today, we are going to do Newland, the assignment, one of the two assignments for the last class, because we didn't get to it last time, and um, revenge and depression. So we have three readings, but I did say that on some announcement somewhere. Um, so question is, Aiden, did you read it? I read um, the biology of the spirit and then the revenge and forgiveness. I did not read the uh, okay. The Einstein. So I'll, I'll, the third one was depression. Um, Haley. Oops, your microphone isn't on. Haley? There we go. I read the, um, the Revenge and Forgiveness and the Depression. I did not read the biological one. Okay. All right. Um, Samantha? I read the, I think it's like, Tip it six personal virtues for articles class session review. I went over that and I got into starting to read Newland. Okay, but you didn't read the depression or the. No, I haven't got to the depression one yet. Okay. Um, Shamima? So this year I read the events and the depression one. I didn't read another one. <laughs> I can't really hear you. Let's see. You could just say I read. Can you hear me? Yes. I read the ribbon ones and the depression ones. So I didn't read another one. Okay, good. Um, Blaine. Yes, I read uh, the ones that were in the Google Classroom post for this class. The okay. Tip it, depression one, and then the colic one. I read them. Okay, Liam? I think I read all of them but the depression one. Okay. I don't remember anything about depression. <laughs> it would have been appropriate for what's going on at Lion. But, uh, Rossi? I read everything, Dr. Beck. Okay. Shah Shanaz? Okay, uh, please type it in the chat. If you don't type it in the chat, I'm gonna think that, okay. Yes. Uh, I have read the passing about Jews. And well, uh, uh, I just uh, read the depression, just a little bit, not that much. Okay, and you didn't read Newland, and you didn't read the Revenge one? I had read down the personal virtues and the depression ones. Oh, I can't. I still, I still didn't hear that, but okay. Um, Alexis? Okay, two-thirds. Um, Giovanni? I did uh, the, I read the depression one and some of the forgiveness one, not the, not the last one. Okay, uh, Nahida? Professor, I have read the depression one and from the previous class, I have read what is scholars for because I did skipped it before. You didn't read the revenge one? No, Professor. But you did read the Biologically of the Spirit? Did you read the readings for last time? Okay. Um, all right. Destiny, did you read the assignment? Not going to lie, Dr. Beck, I did not. Sorry. Okay. And what I'm saying is if there's three times like that, 
then the grade starts going down because this is a discussion group class, you know. Um, Thomas. Uh, yes, I read the uh, Biology of the Spirit, Revenge, and uh, New Ones. And Depression? I did not get around to the Depression one. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Untari. What did you read? Okay. Okay. All right. One half. Um, Puna. No. Okay. Um, let's see. So is Nimra here? Nimra or Shraboni? Are they here? Okay. Is Felipe here? Nope. All right. Okay. So what what I'd like to, of course, what I wanted to do was to put you in groups three different times. Um, so I don't, so I guess what I'll have to do is talk more than I wish. And then please take notes on what you would like to say in groups, because I do want to put you in groups. The reason why I set up this class for two sides of the world was so that you would talk to each other, you know, not so that I would sit and have to tell you what's in the reading. <laughs> so uh, please pay attention. Uh, please come prepared. And um, I guess I am just going to have to show you that I did change the syllabus so that I have very specific requirements about when you get stuff in and your grade going down um, if you don't. So sorry about this. It's just, it's been a month and it's disappointing. So you have to come, attendance is required. Um, please take note. Um, so if an assignment is more than one week late, it has, there has to be a reason. And after one week, I'll begin lowering the grade unless there is a really good reason. Now, a number of students have really good reasons, but here's how it works. Um, coming to class without being prepared, I'm gonna have to hold, hold you to the line on that. Um, so that's, that's the new policy. Um, let's see. And so now I will get to the readings for today. There are papers coming up in a couple weeks. I posted the um, paper. Let's see. The virtues, okay, so please remember these virtues. A number of you said you read them over, that's good, because we're going to look at that while we look at the reading for today. Um, this was the reading for last time. Um, and here's for this time. The requirements for the paper are in the syllabus. Uh, I, the, yeah, here we go. So I have the, um, topics. I have the rubric. The syllabus has the word count and the number of quotes. So I think all the details are there. I have office hours tomorrow night if you would like to have more questions or if you want. I When I, when I was at Lyon, I always required students to come in and talk to me about their papers. Like they should come with a thesis, an outline, some idea what they, they want to write. And then I'll work with them to help make the thesis more complex, more creative, more consistent. So I, I like doing that, but I don't require it anymore for various reasons. 
Um, there, you know, the time differential, I'm not as available as I was when I used to just pretty much live in my office. So, all right. So here is, here's my outline. So I'm going to go over this biology, the spirit, if anybody wants to comment before I put you in groups, you know, if anybody just wants to react, I know that in the class, the Lion class before AUW semester started, a lot of the students were thinking about the issues that have come up in these readings. And so when they were talking about that, I thought, oh, I wonder what they're going to think of these readings. So here we are. Um, so the main theme of all of Krista Tippett's interviews is what is the relationship between science and religion or social science and religion? And every person she interviews has a different point of view. But that's what liberal arts education is trying to get you to, you know, you're forced to think in all these different ways, and then you have to make sense out of it. But you can also, you also can read about how many other people have made sense out of it, which is their worldview, right? So he's telling you his worldview and how he worked it out. It's based on, it's related to his life story, uh, but not entirely, right? It's related to his profession as a surgeon, but not entirely. You don't have to be a surgeon. Um, all right. So he said, we seek balance. Now that should remind you of Aristotle, right? <laughs> Aristotle's entire ethical system is virtue is a mean between extremes. You can be too emotionally repressed, too self-indulgent, too afraid, not afraid enough, too generous, not generous enough, and on and on. So this one brings in biology. Aristotle's father was a doctor and Aristotle is his view of virtue is biological. He, his view of happiness is just the equivalent of a well-functioning human being, somebody whose brain and body, their thoughts, their emotions, their actions, their way of life, their choices is all at a very high level. So they're integrating all those virtues and they play lots of different social roles. So all these different neurons are firing all over the place. Uh, but within, in the midst of this very complex life, you also try to find the middle ground in every decision that you make. And so he's saying, this is a biological accomplishment of, based on evolution. So, over time, evolutionarily, our ability to adapt and to find the middle ground has enabled us to survive. And so over time, people get smarter about that. And then they start writing down and educating each other and teaching each other about what lessons they learned from the past. So wisdom literature is a lot about, OK, we, may, we accomplished a few things and we made some mistakes and now we're gonna tell you some stories or we're gonna tell you the history so that you can learn from our successes and you can also learn from our failures. So that's how we, that's, and then we keep evolving. So we can go from natural evolution to social evolution. So we go from, uh, less complex societies to more complex societies. But of course, at this point in history, there is a big question of whether we will destroy everything. Um, everything is at stake at this point. But, you know, we have, we have tools, we have our brains, 
Um, and we just have to keep using them in a way that can enable us to self-correct and become sustainable, right? We have to seek balance. We are out of balance as a society, as individuals a lot, but that has to change. Um, the next point is that you can have this opinion and be an atheist or an agnostic, or you can believe in a, some kind of creator. I mean, your creator can be a woman as far as I'm concerned, right? The great goddess, or it can be, um, uh, you know, the Christian God, the Jewish God, the Muslim God, or it can be karma, the Brahman, doesn't matter. <laughs> The main position is this constant, just what he's talking about, this drive to flourish. Um, we live in a world with the capacity to create itself and to constantly become more creative. I think all of you are, your job in life, one, your main job in life is to create your life and create your society. So as, especially the women at AUW are living at a time when women's ability to contribute to society at a higher level is taking huge leaps forward. And so in their generation, it'll be much greater than it is right now. But that's a creative activity. So you can associate your ambitions for women's rights with this whole process. Um, and then the students at Lyon can also decide. I mean, I think the US is, I hope, is going to be at the forefront of creating a sustainable way for human beings to flourish because we have so much technology and we have so many institutions that can teach engineering and all the, the um, kinds of knowledge we need. So that's another, there's, your generation has a lot of creative activity to engage in. <laughs> so that's social, but it also uses nature. And, and um, yeah, so that's how I would apply his ideas right now. For us to disagree though, and for religion to become a tool to undermine each other and cripple each other, and prevent each other from uh, flourishing, that's, that's a really big mistake. So this is one version of how you can avoid having animosity between atheists and believers, for example. What about free will, right? And the struggle. So Newland grew up in Orthodox Judaism and he said he carried around a lot of guilt. He just, his parents made him feel guilty just for being born. <laughs> You're born a sinner and you have to obey or you have to feel guilty. You're never good enough. Um, now, Aristotle said, if you, want, if you want an adult that's flourishing, you have to raise your kids to um, engage in activities of generosity, uh, follow the golden rule, be kind to each other, and take pleasure in it. Like you can't say to your kid, be nice to your brother, right? You have to say, your brother is nice. Why would you want to pick on your brother, right? That's what I used to tell my kids. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Actually, I haven't asked them lately what they thought of all that or if they paid attention, but I really never got into the syndrome where the Im implication was, you don't want to do what's good and I'm gonna make you. That I never wanted them to, that seed to get planted in their head. I, cause kids aren't, you know, if you just treat them according to the golden rule, they, it makes them feel more secure right? They assume everybody else is nice too. <laughs> and I mean, they have to learn they're not. But in general, um, 
I think teaching a kid you can't trust anybody and, they, and that they themselves are sinners. I just think that makes people conflicted. But that's what Newland, that was his experience. Um, let's see, does, what does our culture do? Does our culture support uh, the love of virtue or for the sake of making money, does our culture constantly try to get people to be self-indulgent? Um, and then you can, you can say that for your own culture too. What is your culture nurturing? What is it rewarding? Um, anyway, then Newland himself said that his religious beliefs were just obsessional thinking. He was afraid, right? He was afraid of hellfire and brimstone or something. So you can talk about, did you grow up with that kind of a fear? Um, was it healthy? Different kids respond differently to the same kind of upbringing. So later on in the article on depression, Andrew Solomon had a strict Jewish upbringing, but he, that was a matter of security for him. That was uh, something he relied on and that helped him. So kids are different too. And it's really hard to tell. Um, he changed his mind. Okay, so he went from being a flaming atheist to um, thinking that, you know, um, God is a God of love. You know, if you do believe in God, um, then you would you would just enjoy being alive. You wouldn't have those obsessional thoughts. But um, so he's defining free will in a way that fits with uh, neuroscience, right? The synapses and nerve cells and neurotransmitters in your brain, right? So, so what they're studying now is that, yeah, those, your thoughts can govern how those synapses form or um, you can reform your, your body chemistry, your brain, according to your ideas. Um, the art of medicine, here's another point. Um, he, he just thinks all, of a, all a doctor does is remove obstacles so the patient can return to a state, their natural state, which is to be healthy. So the doctor doesn't make people healthy. It's not like your body wants to be sick. Um, and this is, um, okay, so there's something out of balance in your body. And so the doctor's job is to regain the physical balance just like the virtues are the emotional balance and the thought process balance in your thoughts. So Socrates actually described two kinds of medicine as a, it was practiced in Athens. And one of them was this idea that the doctor just brings someone back to health. So they're normally healthy, they get sick, they go to the doctor, the doctor gives them a potion, they throw up, they have diarrhea, they get this poison out of their body and they either go back to work or they're dead. <laughs> and then he said, there's this other corrupt kind of medicine where people don't take care of themselves, they don't eat right, they don't exercise and the doctor's job is to be an enabler, right? Oh, I can, you know, I can solve um, hangovers, right? I got this little formula uh, therapy for, so you don't have a hangover after you get drunk the night before, or I have a therapy for, you know, how to eat all you want and not get fat, or I have a therapy for how you never have to exercise, but you won't suffer any complications. And that's a corrupt notion of medicine, but it makes a lot more money <laughs> than the other one. But anyway, Newland is the more simple, uh, healthy, natural kind of doctor. Um, then he talks about the word, the human spirit, the human soul. And so 
you should think about if you use those words at all in your past um, and how you use them or how the people around you use them and why you rejected, either you rejected those views or you accepted them. But what he's pointing out is that um, it's a biological word. The word soul is a translation for psyche. And so psychology is supposed to be about your soul. Well, we don't associate what preachers say, talk about when they say soul with what psychologists talk about. So you have to dissociate the associations you've had with this word and just see what other meanings it could have. So for Aristotle, it's just being a flourishing activities of the, your psyche. When your psyche is functioning in a completely biologically healthy way, that means you have a healthy soul. Um, then you should uh, be kind to everyone because everyone um, has suffered. And next time I'm gonna have you reading about stress and then about unjust suffering. So we're just gonna go over a lot of the different kinds of ways that human beings suffer unjustly. And of course, with COVID, this is a big deal. So it's kind of right, right in your face. But all of my students pretty much have suffered unjustly at, by the time they get into college and they have had to think about it. But um, I just ask them to think about it a lot more systematically and in terms of the human condition, like it's nobody's fault. <laughs> it's just the human condition. But it's because of that, that you should be kind to people and you should try to understand them. Um, and this is a huge deal in my country right now, the polarization. People aren't just sitting down and listening to each other um, and trying to understand each other. So, and that's destroying our democracy. So just basic humanity, you can have a point of view that's based on biology, how you can get people to function biologically better, but that's also the way to help them maintain a free and open society to avoid authoritarianism. Um, then he says, the more personal you are, the more universal you are. And this is a big theme. I mean, I this all pops up to me because I've done my, my scholarship on Greek culture. And so Greek tragedy and poetry, but it's all wisdom literature is like this. It tries to tell a story, what looks like individual people in individual situations, but an artist, the thing that makes an artist an artist, their gift is to be able to see a pattern in human experience and to write a story that will enable all the people who hear it or see it played out they can identify with that. Oh, that's like me, or that's like my brother, or that's like my friend. So you can make analogies because it taps more deeply into the psyche, into those parts of the brain. If they're closer to the brain stem, we're all wired the same, the same way. And so we, the more primitive part of the brain has more similar kinds of wiring. And then the cerebral cortex, you know, the part that is uh, always reacting to the outside world, well, that would be different for everybody. And that's totally different for every, everybody. Like every time you get up in the morning and walk around, you're having unique experiences. But the artist tries to get you to dig a little deeper, dig a lot deeper. And so uh, many times when, for example, you fall in love or your spouse dies, you tend to feel the most isolated, right? You just feel like nobody's ever felt this way before. But as a matter of fact, that's what the artists realize. Everybody has. 
And so they try to tell these stories that help people understand you're not alone. You other people have been through this for good or bad, right? Um, so that's the way to educate yourself so that you know that the more personal you are, the more universal you are. Um, then what's needed between science and religion is not to debate, right? Either or, somebody wins and somebody loses, but a conversation. And that's what I wanna do in this class is give you a whole lot of different choices and to try not to set up an either or. Now, the students might write their papers either or, this is how I think Dr. Beck, you can't, and that's fine. Students think however they wanna think, and I don't have anything invested in how you think. I have something invested in what material I present to you. And so I think it's just a matter of professional um, integrity to make, to try and give you as much variety as I can um, so that you can be informed and you're better able to create a better worldview. But I truly have no, nothing at stake for where you end up. And just to try and help verify that, uh, my dad was a preacher and he was not, he didn't tell people what to do either, but he did speak out for the civil rights movement. He did say, you need to get involved. You need to speak out against the Vietnam War. You need to speak out against racism. And um, I remember thinking that when I grow up, I want people to take these things seriously, but I don't want to tell them what to do. I just have a hard time trying to control other people's behavior, <laughs> but I do want them to think about it so that they have to good, give good reasons. That matters to me a lot. So when my dad used to say, you should demonstrate against the war, well, then I would find out that some people were demonstrating for the wrong reasons. And that mattered a lot to me. And it, it mattered a lot because the, the stories about the demonstrators have been tainted by the mixed motives of the demonstrators. So I think it was about American imperialism. And America is, are we going to try to be democratic? Or are we going to just try to be an empire? Um, but other people who demonstrated were pretty narcissistic. They just didn't want to get drafted, you know? And so, so it does matter if you give reasons. And if you, and um, so it doesn't matter to me if you're an atheist or an agnostic or, I don't know, I had a Satanist once. And I've had a dudist. I've had a lot. <laughs> it's kind of fun to see how many different types you can get. So I'm eager to find out how you think. Um, then um, what you could do if you want in your posts, especially, you can react to what Newland says. Then I'm going to put you in breakout groups and you bet, I hope you have something to say in your breakout groups because then you can write that in your post. But also I'd like you to apply Aristotle's virtues to Newland's view of flourishing, right? Or also what would Socrates, right? How does Socrates view of life and his way of living and his values do they fit with what Newland is saying or not? Um, and then I didn't get to Jesus. So whenever I ask about Jesus, I didn't get there in the lecture. So you can ignore it. Or for those of you who are Muslim, you can say, what would Muhammad do? Uh, we'll, we'll get to this later on in the class. Or if you're Buddhist, or if you're Hindu, or if you're Confucian, or if you're a humanist, or if you're any of a number of kinds of humanists. So you can fill in the blank there if you want to. Um, all right.
So what I'm going to do is I am going to put you into two breakout groups and um, I will let you screen share, right? I'll give everybody, I think everybody then gets the power to screen share if they want to. So if somebody wants to go back to a Newland quote and focus the group on that, but otherwise I'll give you 15 minutes. Does anybody have a, and I certainly hope after I've talked for way too long, but half an hour, whatever, that you'll, you have something to say, something stuck out in your mind. So there you go. Um, Okay, I am going to move, move her to group one. Move. Jeez, that's too many. I guess I won't. Um, there's just more. One from A to B. Oh, there's two. Okay. Shanaz, can you join the group? In an attempt to in an attempt to overthrow the Khmer Rouge soldiers. And so what they did was they bombed like the southeastern part of Cambodia, more than half a million tons of bombs were dropped during that time. It's more than the total numbers of bombs dropped in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and World War II combined in just one small area. And so my parents grew up during that time, and they were forced to become child soldiers where they have to spy on their own family and report any instances that their own family go against the like the what they call onka onka is like the government during that time and so all the children belongs to onka and onka is like their family and so all the children have to be loyal and they were brainwashed and the experience and the trauma that they went through some lost their limbs because of the bombings those um experience still live with them today and there are parts of cambodia that still have mines and bombs and unexploded bomb bomb unexploded mines and the effects of the bombings are still present today so yeah do people have any um is there anybody to take revenge against? Is revenge an issue? Um, I feel like now revenge is not much of an issue, except um, people are mad at the Khmer Rouge leaders. And so their form of revenge was wanting a 
um, death penalty for the for like the remaining two three um, Khmer Rouge leaders that are still surviving. They're going through trial, and all of all three of them are still in prison. But a lot of the people want to have a death penalty, and there there were some who requested the government to have the death penalty in public so that. Um, people who have lost their family members and their loved ones during that time were able to see and witness it and somehow maybe like release that anger or that sadness on them. But I'm just like, it's, it, it surprised me that a lot of them weren't mad at the Americans, that no one even talked about the Americans and like the bombings, despite like America don't even like, even take like responsibility for the bombings like they didn't even accept that the bombings was their fault when it actually was and yeah but the, it's like a lot of Cambodians don't even like talk about the bombings don't even know who did all the bombings and they they have no attachment or no feelings attached to the bombing at all which surprised me so much despite the damages and the trauma that the bombings had done to them. So, yeah. Okay. Did any of the rest of you um, live in countries? I know Untari, Indonesia, had uh, some really awful stuff for a while. Um, did, you, did you follow that? The, there were some mass killings in Indonesia that are just now sort of coming out publicly. Did any of the rest of you live in a country that had, um, you know, a serious issue where revenge became uh, crippling in your country? Well, Ru Shamima is a Ruinga Muslim and her has been kicked out of the Myanmar. So uh, do people have revenge fantasies? Do they, why did they kick them out? I mean, there's, anyway, I, I don't wanna get into it that much, but I will put you in groups just in general about revenge and what you think of the, I guess the article, right? About the nature of revenge and forgiveness and um, you know what to do about it, how to structure things in a way that would promote a higher quality of life for everybody. So let me just try that, see, how, see um, what you can do with that. Let's see, I think, all right. Giovanni, can you go into your group? Jamie, can you go? Okay, so um, I want to make sure everybody does know when assignments are due for what day. So um, what I'll do is I'll make sure and put it on the video if people... Um, 
if people are didn't get to class and they um so i'm trying to see okay so the schedule that i have here it's true it does have um september 11th it has depression um but we were you know we've gotten behind a little bit and um so next time i'll do we'll do depression and we'll do stress and we'll do the list of aristotle's virtues um i as i recall i i had you read um that whole a uh, 25 page um well anyway yeah the main reading for the day on may 29th was uh, uh 25 pages about aristotle's ethics and then um so i yeah i will make sure to get that straightened out um, if you do have questions, like if you notice that, please send an email so I can straighten out uh, the assignments. And for next time, we'll do depression and stress, and then we'll go back to the personal virtues of Aristotle, because this is, this is the end of the material for the first paper, is... Um, because stress, depression, those issues, usually people are thinking about themselves and their body chemistry, whatever. Obviously, there's a connection between what's going on with your own feelings of revenge or stress or depression and the society at large. So you can't ever really separate yourself. But that's what we'll focus on through next class. And then I will post, you know, the paper. Um, I, I think I've already posted the paper topics and the paper requirements and the rubric. Yes, Professor. Okay, is, is that true of the American students? I mean, I should check that to make sure with the American students. Did you see, do you know if you saw the paper rubrics and the paper topics? Okay, well, anyway, um, let's see. So then I did, I did ask you to read what is college for, for last time. And um, because, okay, so the time before last was when I gave you that short clip about whether students felt like they could talk freely in college and people were saying, no, they're silenced. Students feel like they can't talk. It was a professor from Tulane. And so that was something I added recently because I thought it's relevant. It, it relates to liberal education. It relates to what Greece was about. And then uh, Destiny said, we still have more to, to process on this. And so for the next day, I added this reading, what is college for? Because it does talk about that. Um, and then I pushed back some of the assignments that I had for that day. And then the students couldn't come. So I think that's part of the problem but maybe not all of the problems. So I will check here and make sure, um, because again, I'm, I'm working at two different schools. I might just take, and I want it, yeah. So I had to use the, the Lion syllabus for Lion and then the AUW template for AUW, but I'll try to make sure the schedules are the same and everything is coordinated. I apologize if somebody uh, was confused and if it was legit, obviously. But um, 
please email me because I am on my email a lot. And I, I, you know, I'm really sorry when you come to class and things haven't been clear. So for next time, it's depression, stress, and um, Aristotle with a focus on the personal virtues. So all of these, all four of these, the biology, the spirit, the uh, revenge, depression, and stress, all of these are have a body chemistry to them, and they're related to both your physical self and your mental self, right? Your spiritual self or whatever you want to call it, psychological. But the way I teach it here is the word spiritual just means your idea of the good or your idea of flourishing. Um, so there's there is a mind-body connection. And the neuroscientists say that. Wisdom literature says that. So that's why studying Aristotle's virtues is the mean between extremes. And all of these diseases of the soul are some kind of an extreme. And then with revenge, for example, people aren't gonna be able to step back and avoid taking revenge unless they live in a society with the rule of law and um, that is legitimate, right? That isn't used as a tool for revenge. So one last point, do you remember when Crito said, you know, we're getting you out of here, Socrates. Nobody expected you to get killed. Everybody, when they voted against you, they were just mad. They were just taking revenge. I'll get you out of here. Everything will be fine. And so basically they're using the legal system to score points, right? To take revenge on their political enemies. And when that happens, when the legal system breaks down, then you go back to a more primitive way of living. So that was how I you know, tried to weave them together in the class, but okay, well, we'll see you next week. If you'd like to write your papers now, I would suggest it you know, just to get ahead of the game. Um, okay, any other questions? Everyone can go, it's time to go. I have a question, Professor. Okay.